Welcome, everybody. My name is Gabe Scheinman. I'm the executive director of the Alexander Hamilton Society. It's great to have uh, so many uh, of you with us, and in particular today, and I'll, I'll explain why. I think we're really excited to have this guest in this conversation in particular. For those who may not be familiar with us, uh, you can go to our website, alexanderhamiltonsociety.org, and we'd love to connect with you. But uh, from the students, uh, the alumni, some of our members, some of our faculty in the audience, it's, it's really great to have you with us. Um, Today, you know, we're on Monday, February 28th. Today is, is day five of Putin's second Ukraine war. Um, and while in my mind, this is merely the latest and largest attempt uh, by Putin to squash the West and revise the outcome of the Cold War, it's not a new objective. Um, this, is, this is not a new phenomenon. But we seem to be in a moment where the West has finally, after all these attempts, understood this to be the case um, and seen a variety of decisions and actions in the last couple of days that were probably unthinkable just a week ago, in particular by, I think, our European allies. Um, lurking above all this, uh, and particularly in aligning with Russia, I think is the China threat and one that we cannot and should not put aside. And in many ways, the fast emerging economic uh, decoupling and isolation led by the West against Russia could certainly be interpreted by the Chinese as a beta test uh, for what the West might want to do following a Chinese attack on Taiwan, for example. And so while the consequences of today's actions uh, on Russia and on the world economy will be large, they could very well pale in comparison to even a shadow of this approach on China. And so really as a consequence of that, I really cannot think of a better person at a better time to understand the nature of the US and China competition and how it, it already does and will uh, impact this question of global economic order. And so it's a real privilege to welcome uh, Dr. Aaron Freeberg, uh, uh, to this event. Uh, Professor Friedberg is Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University and co-director of the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Security Studies. He's also one of the founders of the Alexander Hamilton Society and an invaluable colleague of mine on our board of directors. Uh, from June 2003 to June 2005, Dr. Friedberg served as the Deputy Assistant for National Security Affairs in the Office of the Vice President. He served as a consultant to the National Security Council, the Office of Net Assessment, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the Los Alamos National Laboratories. Um, and just last month, he was appointed to a two-year term on the bipartisan, congressionally mandated U.S.-China Economics and Security Review Commission. His latest book, uh, Getting China Wrong, will be published in May, which I know will be a must-read. And today, he's here to discuss his latest article in the winter issue of the Texas National Security Review, The Growing Rivalry Between America and China and the Future of Globalization. Um, before I begin, we'll definitely have time at the end to ask questions, and so to do that, you can submit a question in writing through the Q&A function at the very bottom of your screen, and when uh, I call on you, I'll figuratively hand you the mic, uh, I'll unmute you uh, to ask your question. So, uh, Aaron, it's really great for you to be with us today, and um, one of the reasons I really wanted to host you for a conversation on your articles, because I, I really think your article does a wonderful job uh, uh, putting into context, historical context, the processes of globalization, which is a term that we all use uh, secondhand without really kind of getting into as much as we should. And most importantly, the role or the relationship between globalization and geopolitics, uh, which is something that we are reminded of every day. Um, your article, and I'll, 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 I'll skip to the end because in some ways, uh, as a good political scientist, you, you want to tell your readers where you're going, but you identify five different paths that global trade could take. Um, and assess their likelihood as well as what should be our preference. And they are in order, deglobalization, reglobalization, hegemony with Chinese characteristics, regional blocks, and values-based blocks, and, and we will get into those. But before we do, much of your article is premised on the centrality or the importance of the global distribution of GDP of wealth, and then in particular on the role that trade exports play uh, as a percentage of GDP, as a measure of trade's impact on economic growth. So before we get into an assessment of where we are today, uh, a, a prescription of where we ought to go, maybe you can kind of walk back for us. First is, how, how do you define globalization? You know, uh, why does it matter? And, and second, what in your mind is the relationship between trade, which sometimes we use as a function for globalization, but, but trade and economic power? Well, first of all, Gabe, thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, globalization, uh, the term refers to a process of increasing integration uh, across national units, economic integration, uh, trade uh, and goods, but also services, financial flows, communication, people, um, 
And uh, most economic historians argue that there have been two great periods of globalization, at least in, uh, in the industrial age. And the first one started in the 19th century uh, and was led or driven by Britain. And you had a, a great increase in, in trade and trade share of total GDP. That's the measure that economists usually use to tell you how important trade is. Not that there wasn't trade before, but it was relatively small comparison in comparison to the total wealth and production of, of countries. But that changed over the 19th century into the early part of the 20th century. And then it kind of collapsed largely because of the First World War, or the Great Depression. Um, it came back partially in a kind of partial system that we'll talk about, uh, led by the West after the end of the Second World War. Uh, but that was not true globalization because there were big parts of the world that were left out. Uh, and the second era of globalization really starts with the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall. China had already started you know, 10 years before to become more integrated. And since then, there's just been this explosion of trade, uh, financial flows, uh, and also a change in the way things are made. And this is one thing that's different about this new era of globalization is that uh, largely because of improvements in uh, communication and transportation, it's been possible to break up uh, production processes for all kinds of goods and do pieces of them in different places where it was advantageous for various reasons, including the lower cost of labor in some developing countries, and particularly in China. Um, so that's globalization and these two great eras of globalization. Um, trade in general, I think uh, economists, economic historians would agree, contributes to growth, contributes to economic growth among the, those who participate in it. So it's, it's been responsible for uh, large increases in total global output and well-being over time. So economists see trade, you know, as a as a good thing, and the more of it, the better. One thing that the economists tend not to pay so much attention to, uh, but which turns out to be very important in the long run, is the fact that countries, even when everybody's growing, not everybody is growing at the same pace. And what that means is that over time, rapidly growing countries can expand their wealth and expand their power and change the international distribution of power. And that often leads to instability and sometimes it leads to breakdowns in, in trade and economic flows. And one question, big question is whether we're at the brink of such a change in the structure of the global economy. I mean, I was gonna say, even in your, in your description of globalization eras, the terminology you were using is geopolitical ones, right? I mean, the, the, the world wars, the cold war and so forth. Um, in your view, is it that it's the geopolitic, the geopolitics, let's say, that is defining or leading to these different eras of globalization, or is it the other way around, uh, which is these um, trade flows and, to a certain degree, you know, natural order of things and man's quest for a freer market and, and cheaper goods and so forth that's actually helping define the geopolitical eras that come afterwards? Well, it's both, and that they're interactive, and that's really the. Uh, the article starts with uh, my favorite quote from my, uh, my former colleague, uh, the late Bob Gilpin, where he talks about how these two things are interrelated. He says that the distribution of power at any given moment sets the shape of the economic system that exists among the participants in, in that international system. Uh, but over time, the economic flows that are enabled by that structure change the distribution of power and can lead to changes in the patterns of economic exchange. So they're, they're interrelated. And Gilpin and others argued that uh, historically, again, looking at, uh, at the history of the last 200 years at least, uh, it's been necessary for there to be a hegemonic power, a single state that was considerably stronger than all the others to create and keep open uh, a, a 
more or less open international economic system. And the British were played that role in the 19th century, and the United States has played that role at least in the second half of, of the 20th century. So there's this relationship between the global distribution of power and the structure of the global economy. And Gilpin and others asked the question of whether it's possible to have an open economic system if you don't have a hegemon. And if the relative power of the previously dominant state declines over time, whether that system will tend to collapse. And Gilpin tend, uh, predicted that that would be the case. But you do, even in your paper, though, you do, I would say, kind of distinguish between the first era of globalization and the second one in the sense of what, what sort of drove it. Um, you talk about in your paper that the, the, the first era defined largely as the you know, post-Napoleonic era until kind of World War I was driven a bit more organically um, or, or, or naturally as opposed to some sort of centrally designed uh, 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 process, whereas uh, certainly post-war in the early Cold War years, right, um, it was a it, it was uh, there were architects, uh, you know, the United States in particular saw uh, trade as essential to uh, growth and rehabilitation, in particular in Europe, uh, saw growth and rehabilitation uh, essential as a bulwark uh, against uh, communist subversion. Um, and, and so as a consequence, it was really a, an idea. I don't want to say generated in the lab. It's not quite that way, but um, something I've certainly thought about and, and implemented. So what, what were the distinguishing features as a consequence of those different origins? And I mean, the, your essay ends in this, in, at another moment where we're sort of caught in between the natural order or, or flow of things, as well as do we need to make a decision uh, about how to approach it? But maybe you could start with this, the historical comparison of how we, how we originated those ideas. Yes. Right. And, and it, it is true, I think, that the first year of globalization uh, was something that grew organically. It, it was driven also by British power. And the fact that um, uh, the British led in the Industrial Revolution and became, for a time, the wealthiest country on the planet, uh, is, came to believe in the virtues of, of free trade uh, and tried to persuade others of the virtues of free trade. Uh, so they, and succeeded to a degree, they were, they were the leaders, but there was no um, structure of international institutions that supported this. There was no mechanism like the World Trade Organization. Um, it, it was, again, driven by example and by the fact that many felt they were participating and gaining from participating. It's also true, by the way, that even during that first era, especially as you get towards the latter part of the 19th century, a lot of countries uh, weren't so sure that free trade was in their interest. And many of them saw the British as benefiting disproportionately and imposed protection to develop their own industries, for example. So this idea of infant industry, uh, if the British were ahead uh, in manufacturing all kinds of advanced products at the time uh, and could do so cheaply, but you wanted to have an industry, a steel industry or an arms industry in your country, uh, you might impose tariffs on British imports in order to cultivate a domestic industry. And a lot of the big powers did that, or the emerging big powers, including Germany and including the United States. Uh, so yes, more organic, uh, perhaps. The second era, uh, or the, the what I call the sort of partial or half one and a half years of uh, globalization that starts after the end of the Second World War, as you suggest, was very deliberately uh, built by the United States in conjunction with the British. Um, and it, it wasn't so much cooked up in a laboratory, uh, but it also wasn't just cooked up in theory. It grew out of a belief that the collapse of global trading system had contributed very directly to the rise of of fascism, uh, the rise of communism, and to World War II, and a desire to prevent that, if at all possible, after the war was over. Um, and what happened was uh, the Soviets and the countries under their influence uh, withdrew into their own economic bloc, didn't want to participate in this global system that the Americans and the British were creating, but the U.S. and the British, particularly over time, the U.S. being the most important, uh, pushed this, advocated it, uh, helped to develop inst institutions like the uh, General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which preceded the WTO, World Trade Organization. 
um, to promote greater openness, to lower trade barriers. Uh, and over time, it was it was quite successful. So for a time, uh, countries in Europe, uh, recovering uh, economies in Asia maintained uh, uh, barriers to imports from the United States in order to rebuild their economies. And the US sort of let them do that. But over time, all the countries in this system lowered their uh, trade barriers and trade took off. And you know, you could argue that it had within the confines of that system, it had exactly the effect that the architects had hoped. Uh, the Europeans, uh, the West Europeans, didn't you know go back to war with one another, and they, uh, in particular, established a, a trading zone within that larger free trade zone. Uh, Japan profited greatly, and within that zone, uh, there was increasingly prosperity and also stable democracy uh, and peace, at least among those countries. So that, that worked. And the hope was at the end of the Cold War, where again, the Americans were the principal drivers and architects, that it would be possible to expand that system now finally to include everybody. And that everybody who entered into the system, including the Russians and their former satellites, including China, uh, would not only benefit economically, but in time would liberalize politically. That was the, the grand design. And as we see, that hasn't worked out. And and the the way your, your article is written, you sort of get to that, um, it's what you call globalization 2.0, but in, for our purpose, in some ways, the third phase in that vein. And, and I don't think you use the word naive, but uh, but obviously certainly some, um, uh, you know, we, we either misunderstood or the ink spot method to grow this uh, system did not work, but I, and it's something I'll, we'll come back to because in many ways it's the predicate for obviously where we are today. But b before we do that, I, I do want to jump into, which is obviously our, our cold war, what you call globalization 1.5 era economic system was certainly a success and certainly in retrospect, but was it really the, the, the preference of our uh, post-war leaders in the, in the immediate aftermath of the war? I mean, in, in a lot of ways that, that period from 1945, maybe a little bit earlier to 1946, 1947, we sort of had a concept of the world that was not exactly, let's break this down into blocks. I mean, it was very much a, a one world concept. We thought we could bring the Soviets into it. This applied to way beyond uh, questions of, of trading regimes and so forth, including security regimes, among other things. And so I, I, I totally agree that, you know, in retrospect, and even after a relatively short amount of time, this was seen as a major success in preventing the collapse, the total collapse, let's say, uh, of our position compared to the Soviets. But in the moment, how did some of our leaders actually pivot from that um, larger goal or larger transition um, uh, in order to, um, uh, in order to uh, get to what we later then see uh, as a stronger position? Well, it's true that uh, in the latter stages of the Second World War and the very early post-war period, there were people in the US and Britain, um, in the West generally, who hoped that it would be possible to build a, a global system. Uh, and that was the original intent and that was the original thought you know, behind the United Nations. Um, it quickly became apparent that that would not be possible buy into it and saw it, in fact, as a way of, of weakening them and so established <clears throat> barriers, political, economic, and of course, physical barriers between their zone and, and the West. And once that became clear, uh, I think Western leaders pivoted to the idea that, well, at least we're going to pursue this ambition among ourselves. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't clear at the outset exactly who was going to be drawn into that, how big it would grow or how successful it would be. Uh, but it became a key part of U.S. and Western Cold War strategy for competing with the Soviets, uh, because the belief was freer trade among Western countries would promote economic growth, countries that had you know, healthy economies would be able to contribute more to their own defense. And it wasn't obvious at the end of the war exactly how the Europeans or Japan were going to recover from having been so badly damaged during the war. Uh, and the belief also was that growth would uh, enable stable 
democracies who would be good allies of the United States. So this policy was, um, was a strategic policy. It was not just an economic policy. One of the themes that you have throughout your paper, and it's certainly the one that is the most present today, which is the, the, the liberalizing nature or liberalizing effect, let's say, of, of, of globalization or, or the putative one. Um, and that, um, I'll, to, I don't think it's, you phrase it exactly this way, but I think it's, it's basically the crux of your piece about the, the, the third era, which is the, the post-Cold War, which is we, we maybe assumed that uh, the, the liberalizing effect or the liberalizing uh, push in terms of accession from the post-Soviet space in China into, the, into our bloc would actually have that uh, required or, or desired uh, effect on things in the, in the way that it did for Europe. Um, but in many ways, we, we still had a number of illiberal states inside our Cold War trading block. I mean, I, I'm not, not the majority. They weren't, let's say, as large as, as China, um, but South Africa, you know, Pakistan, Egypt, Turkey, Korea before uh, it was democratic, um, you know, Singapore and so forth. So I guess my question more for you is, 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 is it a question about the liberal nature of these regimes that allows these the bloc, particularly in the Cold War, to work? Or is there something about a, a certain set of geopolitical interests that are really drivers? And, and the reason I ask is because when obviously dealing with China today, um, there's a big difference between saying it is simply a question about the nature of regimes, in which case a state like you know, Vietnam um, or even Singapore might be outside where we'd want it to be, versus a question of geopolitical interests um, and care about a set of practices that matter a lot more. Well, of course, that's a, that's a big question with a lot of things wrapped up in it. Some of it has to do. With I'm not going to. I'm not going to ask you small questions. Okay. So. All right. All right. <laughs> that's why you get paid the big bucks. Now I, have to, <laughs> now I have to answer it. Um, just talking about this in sort of geopolitical terms, it's certainly true that there were illiberal countries within this larger system of alliances and alignments, and also within the, this larger trading system over time. Um, that's undoubtedly true. The majority, and increasingly over time, the majority of the members in, of the system were in fact democratic. And as far as the trading system went, the vast majority of the wealth was generated by those sort of core countries in Western Europe and, and Northeast Asia, all of whom by the end of the Cold War were, uh, were democratic. Um, but yes, uh, even then, or maybe especially then, uh, the United States was willing to do business literally and figuratively with illiberal regimes uh, because it saw that as a way of, of holding off the expansion of the Soviet Union and the spread of, of communism. So yeah, there were, uh, there were uh, concessions to kind of practicality. I think one of the things that's interesting about just this sort of larger question about our, our attitudes towards other regimes is that as American policy became uh, in some ways more focused on ideology towards the end of the Cold War, the United States actually played the key role in putting pressure on friends and allies of ours who had uh, gone off in illiberal directions, like South Korea, like the Philippines, uh, to some extent, Taiwan as well. So uh, there was a conscious effort, I think, in the latter stages of the Cold War, not only to compete with the Soviets and to align with whoever you needed to in order to do that, but to try to promote democracy in those parts of our system where it didn't yet, uh, had not yet taken firm root. So is, is, should I take that to mean, and, and you could also point to the post-Cold War experience in, in much of Central and Eastern Europe, right, where it seemed to did have a positive effect in that way, but should I take that to mean that we shouldn't, we shouldn't put in the trash bin uh, the concept that uh, uh, a kind of liberal trading regime uh, based around the United States and, and, and dominated by, let's say, liberal democracies still can have a politically liberalizing effect on states seeking to join it, and, and China, Russia happen to be exceptions, or is there, or is that just, you know, something that was a, a nice uh, thing to, to, to aspire to, uh, certainly would a useful rhetorical tool um, but uh, uh, basically, is, 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 that, is that something that we should keep um, as a concept and, and could be one that continues to animate our foreign policy or one that was 
you know, holiday from history and, and, and really one that we can't, we can't foresee seeing and using again. I don't think the, the idea that um, trade and economic growth um, have a tendency to contribute to the liberalization of societies and of their political systems. First of all, I don't think that was totally you know, nonsense and, and unfounded. Uh, there was a body of theory, there was a body of historical experience that supported that view. Um, and in the, if we're getting into the post-Cold War period, uh, at least in the places where the West had the leverage to try to uh, make as a requirement for integration into our system that new members liberalize both politically and economically, it did have some success. I mean, certainly this is true in, in Eastern Europe, although there has been backsliding from that. Um, the problem, I think, is that in the case of both Russia and China, uh, the West didn't have that kind of leverage and didn't try to use it. And the expectation and the hope was that just the process of integration and the growth that that would uh, enable would in and of itself unleash processes of liberalization in those societies and would lead them eventually to become more like us and more democratic. That was uh, uh, turned out to be a mistake or it didn't work that way. And we can talk, you know, that's, that's basically what my book is about with respect to China, why it didn't work. I mean, in that case, it didn't work because the people running the show in China wanted to make sure that it didn't work. And they came up with pretty successful ways of, you know, having their cake and eating it too, being integrated into our economic system, but maintaining firm political control. So I don't think we should uh, give up on that idea uh, entirely, but Right now, we have to recognize uh, that it hasn't achieved its intended political and strategic um, uh, results, at least as far as Russia and China are concerned. And moreover, that the economic interconnections and societal interconnections that have been enabled by our openness now create strategic vulnerabilities that we have to deal with. Um, so it's one thing to, you know, be importing uh, some large percentage of your energy from Russia if Russia is another democratic country, uh, or if you're not really, you know, or if you believe that it's on the process of becoming one. It's quite another thing if you begin to recognize that that is not happening, and that that country that's the supplier of much of your energy has strategic objectives at odds with yours and is willing and able to use your dependence as a source of leverage over you to try to influence your policies. Um, that was never a good idea. It's become increasingly obvious that it wouldn't, wasn't a good idea as Russia has become more and more uh, revisionist and aggressive. Uh, and it's taken a very big shock to even get people to think seriously now about doing something about it um, because the it was efficient, it was you know, cost effective, it was cheaper to get that energy and people didn't think seriously about the downsides. Well, now they are. Well, let's talk about China because obviously that's the driving, the driving force in, in, the, in the psychological shift that we've seen in the country over the last few years. It's the driving force behind your article. Um, without getting into the, as you said, the crux of your forthcoming book about you know, uh, who, who got it wrong. Uh, and and uh, I'll say for, for the audience that Aaron was not one of them. Um, and there's that, you know, fun phrase that the former President Obama used to always use, which is the arc of history bends towards justice. Well, I think the arc of history bends towards Aaron uh, on, on a number of these uh, questions. So, but, but maybe you could actually trace for us in specific. So um, how has the nature of the Chinese economy and more importantly, how the Chinese view uh, globalization or view the economic order shifted uh, over these last 25 years or 30 years. Um, I think I, I, I looked it up before uh, before today, which is, you know, Chinese exports as a percent of Chinese GDP actually peaked a, a long time ago uh, and have declined as a, as a in relative terms pretty precipitously. There's clearly a change uh, in how China sees things, uh, you know, made in China 2025 and so forth. So maybe you could, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, debase you by saying, uh, you know, put you in the shoes of Xi Jinping for a second, but um, how have the Chinese viewed uh, 
uh, the post-Cold War um, uh, moment here, in particular on this issue. And, and we see it as monolithic, but clearly they see it in, in different stages. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not going to entirely resist the temptation to talk about my book, although I won't reveal that that's exactly what I'm doing, because the question is, is at the heart of what I was interested in, in trying to understand. Um, for China, uh, the decision to uh, open uh, economically uh, goes back to the late 1970s, following the death of Mao, the emergence of Deng Xiaoping, uh, recognizing that that under Mao, China's economy had been ruined and society had been torn apart by the culture of was made and there was general agreement among uh, the Chinese leadership that they had to do something different and they had to start making more use of market mechanisms, uh, starting with letting farmers you know, keep some of the profits from what they made instead of forcing them to be on inefficient collectives. Um, and also welcoming in foreign capital and beginning to build up manufacturing industries largely for exports uh, to, to the developed countries. Um, there was this concept of uh, you know, uh, crossing the river by feeling the stones. You know, I don't think they had at the beginning a clear um, notion of how they were gonna do it. But I think what's emerged over time is at least the people who in the end controlled policy never intended to allow the full liberalization of the economy. Uh, and there's another phrase that one of, one of Deng's uh, counter, uh, counterparts and colleagues used. He said, the, the market is like a bird in a cage. Uh, we, have to, we have to let the bird you know, have some room to fly around and it's good to have the bird, but we need also to keep it in a cage, which means we never can allow economic forces to uh, uh, develop in a way that undermines the, uh, the power of the Communist Party. So the, the question has always been, how do you have economic growth and dynamism while maintaining the power of the CCP? And if you look at the arc of the evolution of China's overall economic policy since uh, the start of so-called reform and, and opening up under Deng Xiaoping, they've gone through a number of kind of models uh, for, for doing that. But what has not happened and what so many people in the West believed inevitably would happen is that uh, the market has not um, expanded or the role of the market has not expanded to the point where the state has sort of shriveled and, and gone away. Um, that has not happened. The, the shape of the cage has, has changed over time. Um, I think the change in attitudes um, in China, and there's a big debate about this among people who were involved, for example, in the negotiation of WTO and people who are specialists on China. Uh, there are some people who, who believe that there were you know, real liberalizers, people who would eventually have pushed policy towards even greater role for the market and perhaps even political liberalization. But the fact of the matter is those people uh, didn't win out. That's not the direction that policy followed. Um, China uh, was successful and grew very well. Oh, Aaron, I don't know if you can hear me. We lost you uh, the microphone wise for a second there. I'm not hearing you very well. There you go. You're back. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why this is why this is a problem. Um, okay. Uh, marry them up with the with. You hear me now? Okay. With um, a large pool of of low cost labor, and become a, a giant manufacturing platform exporting to the rest of the world. That was one part of the model. The other part was directing huge flows of capital into infrastructure, into building uh, not only factories, but roads and, and apartment complexes and buildings and so on. Um, that worked and worked very well. But after the turn of the century, uh, China's leaders began to realize that that model couldn't go on forever. 
it got kind of a new lease on life uh, when China got into the WTO and its trade just shot up. Um, but I think there, were, there was recognition that you couldn't keep growing like that because the world wasn't big enough to absorb all of that production to allow you to you know, grow at 10% a, a year, year on year. And also because at some point you built so many bridges and so many apartment buildings and so many roads that building more was inefficient and wasteful and you were directing all this capital towards stuff that wasn't really contributing to your GDP. And the question then became, what should we do? People in the West said, and some Chinese economists, I think, agreed, well, what we have to do now is to go further in liberalizing and um, allow financial institutions to invest based on expectations of return, not because the party decides that they should invest. Um, shift more of the uh, emphasis in growth towards consumption, you know, let Chinese people have more of the returns from their labor and buy more things with it instead of using huge dollops of investment to continue to, uh, uh, to continue to grow. So there was a formula that everybody sort of agreed on, everybody in the West agreed on. The problem with it was it would have required the Chinese Communist Party to relax its grip in ways that it had never done before. And it wasn't going to do that. Um, I think the uh, decision was made, or a series of decisions were made, starting at the end of the Hu Jintao, but really picking up under Xi Jinping, to try to emphasize technology uh, and technological advance and make that the new driver of Chinese growth, recognizing uh, you know, that the, uh, this big bubble of low cost labor was going to shrink because of the changes in demographics. Um, so wage costs were going to go up. The way to keep growing was to increase productivity. And the way to increase productivity was to make technological breakthroughs and advances. Uh, and that's been, I think, the central feature of, of Chinese economic strategy over the course of the last decade. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they have uh, exerted such efforts to steal technology from the West, to extract it from companies that want to have access to their market. That's been one of the major sources of growing friction between, between China and the rest of the world. Um, just a last comment on this. I think from the beginning, the CCP leaders realized that opening up to the extent that they were going to, integrating into the global economy to the extent that they did, was risky. Um, you know, Dung had this comment about, you know, when you open the window, you get fresh air, but also flies come in. Uh, so dangerous ideas um, and dangerous trends in your society, and you have to control them. Um, I think also China's leaders realized that their dependence on the West and on the United States in particular was a source of vulnerability. After Tiananmen, uh, the Tiananmen massacre in 1989, this fear that uh, sanctions and uh, maybe permanent uh, restrictions on imports from China are going to be imposed, um, concerns about having to rely on American and Western technology. They've always been anxious about that. Um, but as long as the overall political relationship seemed to be going well, as long as people in the West believed that there were these tendencies at work that were leading towards liberalization, that sorts of vulnerability didn't become real. It wasn't used. What's happened now is that for various reasons, starting with the United States, but other countries too, uh, that dependence has become a source of obvious vulnerability for China. And they're shifting directions in various ways to try to make themselves less vulnerable. The technology part, again, is the key. Becoming self-reliant in technology so that you don't have uh, companies like Huawei being cut off from critical components that are made with IP that's licensed in the United States that the US government can insist that companies don't sell the companies in China. They're vulnerable, they realize it. And, and that's what's driving their current strategy. 
Um, just one last, I'm sorry, I keep saying one last, but you, you asked me another super complicated question. Um, another aspect of the strategy, if one part is we're going to uh, increase productivity, uh, another part is that over time, we're going to try to reduce our dependence on exports, as you said, uh, meaning allow increases in consumption, but also we're going to try to reduce our dependence on exports to the advanced industrial countries that happen to be democracies that we don't trust that may at some point impose restrictions on us. And I think that's what's behind the so-called Belt and Road Initiative. And that's what's behind China's interest in the developing world, or it's part of what's behind it. The belief that over time, uh, Africa's population grows to 2 billion people. If there is uh, sustained economic growth there, that'll be a source of markets for Chinese exports. And China will become less and less reliant uh, on, on the US and on the West to absorb what it produces. There's this quote, um, General McMaster uh, uh, records uh, conversation, I forget it was Li Keqiang, it was, it was one of the high level Chinese officials that he met with and McMaster, who I think is an honest person is not making things up, says that at some point his counterpart said, listen, in the future, uh, we Chinese are going to be the leading technological country. We're going to be producing all the high end stuff. And you guys, you Americans are going to ma mainly be a supplier of raw materials. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll buy your food and maybe your scrap metal and, and uh, maybe some energy and so on. But we're going to be at the top of this pyramid and you guys are going to be lower down. Well, it's a, it's a good it's a good segue to talk about your kind of spend time talking about your five sort of alternatives as you see of where this is going and um, and then after that we'll get the questions and so just a reminder if you have questions submit them in the Q and A function at the bottom of the screen and then I can actually kind of call on you when we get to that so um, as I laid out the outset you sort of you know based first on our own domestic realization of where this has gone a better in some ways um, understanding of what the Chinese have done. Uh, and how they've articulated it um, over the last couple of years. Um, Aaron, can you hear me? Or uh, now I can. If okay. you just repeat the first part of the question. I'm so sorry. I, I, I was going to say, in, in some ways, partially because of the domestic, you know, revelation here in, in the United States, and then I think as you are articulately outlined, you know, how the Chinese have strategized or seen it going on their end you've kind of walked through five different scenarios. And I don't think we need to go into detail on all of them because I think the first one, deglobalization, I think is uh, fairly obvious as to what it really means. Um, and in some ways it's the most dangerous one, but a, as you put it, a very, very, very low likelihood based on sort of the natural way of things. Reglobalization, uh, which in some way would be the preferable one, but I think you assess is basically impossible um, uh, given the nature of the Chinese regime and their decision-making. And so the last three are, are, are sort of the, the likeliest scenarios. So one is hegemony with Chinese characteristics. Um, the, the second is sort of breakdown into blocks. And, and then third is maybe a subset of, the, of that one, but it, it's sort of the, the United States actually trying to construct or reconstruct a values-based block. So you hinted at it just now in your answer, but what does a what does a hegemony with Chinese characteristics when it comes to these issues actually look like? Because I think not only in our in your mind, living memory, but between the American hegemony in this, and then before that, the British, we don't really have a great concept uh, of of what this looks like um, in practice and even recent history. And I don't know, maybe it's a question of um, what did the Soviet economic bloc actually look and, and feel like, although the nature of the Chinese system is so fundamentally different, it's hard to make that comparison. So maybe first, if you could kind of briefly go into when you when you say what is Chinese hegemony on this look like, and to a certain degree using their own words, what, what, what would you expect Americans to see in practice of how that actually looks? Well, first, I, I don't think it's very likely, certainly not in, in the foreseeable future for a whole variety of reasons we can talk about, but it's worth thinking about what it might look like. And this takes me back to Gilpin and to the political scientists, if I can, for just a minute. Um, so the idea was, you know, you had to have a hegemon to have an open liberal system. Um, what most of the political scientists who wrote and talked about all that and debated it uh, kind of put to one side was 
the fact that the two hegemons that we've seen who have created these two periods of globalization were both liberal powers. They believed in free trade uh, as a matter of, of principle. Um, Gilpin himself did point out that an illiberal hegemon would likely not construct an open international system, but rather create something that would look more like an imperial system. And he didn't expand on that. And by the way, this was, you know, he's writing this, what, 1975 or something like that. So he was a remarkable uh, thinker. Um, he didn't expand on it. But I think that is more like what you would see, uh, a system that would have China at its center and at the top uh, and others subordinate to it and adjusting their economic policies in ways that suit China. I think one of the things that they are trying to do, even if it's not a global system that they would dominate, because I don't think they believe they can, uh, is to build a partial system of their own that would be made up of mostly illiberal states and mostly poorer and developing countries that would trade with China, allow China to invest, uh, uh, accept a, a subordinate role in a system where China would be the dominant power. Um, so I think that's what they would more naturally prefer. And that's consistent, of course, with the character of their political system in which power is concentrated in uh, a very small number of hands. I don't think they can, they, they believe they can achieve that anytime soon with the United States. But if they could, uh, you know, and people have said, well, China's population is four times that of the United States. Uh, its productivity is less than a quarter that of the United States, which means that its GDP is getting to be almost the same. Suppose that China achieved the same level of productivity as the United States and other advanced industrial countries. Uh, that means that it would eventually have an economy that was four times as large as that of the United States. There was an article uh, back in, I think, 2010 by a famous economist in foreign policy who, who made, this, made this point. Well, if they get to that point, then maybe you could have a, a, a global Chinese system that China dominated. I don't think they're going to get there. But it sounds like to a certain degree, because in, in your article, you say that maybe it's the, the least bad option is that we should be actually focused on reconstructing that values-based system ourselves. But the flip side of that, is kind of what you just outlined, which is by definition, therefore, there will be a number of states that are outside that block, most likely um, dominated by China because of these liberal states. So, how, you know, if, if that's the outcome we want to avoid, but at the same time, it's the um, it's the uh, it's the consequence of the outcome we maybe want best. I, I guess, like, help me how to think about that. I mean, I, I hear President Biden several times say we are not seeking, you know, systems of blocks. Uh, and economic blocks. But at the same time, I think what you're arguing is saying, we actually may not have a choice, even if what is beyond the block is giving up on our, you know, kind of post-Cold War, like liberal expansion dream. I, I, I don't know, help, help me kind of work through those, that dichotomy. Well, uh, I think we're at a point where people are trying to figure out exactly what we should do next and, and what should be the nature of our economic relationship with China. Um, you know, we, we, we opened up to them in the belief that they would become open themselves. And they are more open than they were when the process started, that's true. But they've also uh, maintained and in certain respects raised barriers to trade, investment, and so on. It's not an equitable relationship. So what do we do about it? Well, it seems that, uh, you know, there are uh, there are several alternatives, three alternatives, I guess. One is we could try to compel them to be open. And I think that's sort of what the Trump administration strategy was. Uh, we've been trying to, you know, be patient and work through the WTO in the expectation that they would become more open, but they're not. They keep doing these things that are unfair from our perspective. We're going to hit them over the head with tariffs and force them to change. Well, the United States alone clearly doesn't have sufficient leverage to, to compel those kinds of, of shifts. Um, so then what are you left with? One possibility is you say, well, okay, we can kind of live with this. Uh, yeah, it's not fair, it's disadvantageous to us in certain ways, but it's better 
than uh, if we close ourselves off. And that's been the classic economist argument about how to respond to protectionism, that the protectionism hurts the other guy more than it hurts you ultimately, and you hurt yourself by imitating what they're doing. There are various reasons why I don't think that applies in this case. So that would be an alternative. And we could wind up doing that kind of by default because it's gonna be very difficult to do anything else because there are still strong interests on our side uh, that wanna maintain the system as it exists, even if it is in, uh, inequitable. The alternative is we have to establish some barriers ourselves to protect our economies and societies from penetration and exploitation. We've started to do some of that uh, and some of our friends and allies are starting to do that. I don't think anybody is at this point thinking we're gonna recreate a, a, a block, but I think we're moving in that direction. And I guess the last thing to say there is whatever we do, I think the Chinese preference would be to persuade us to stay open, right? continue to buy our goods, continue to transfer technology, continue to invest your capital in our economies, continue to let our you know, scientists work and be trained in your universities and labs and so on, even as we maintain build these barriers ourselves, and even as we build a block of our own that will be centered around China and which China will, will dominate. Um, I think the, you know, that's the direction I think they are trying to go. And the question is, how are we going to respond? So, so what is, I mean, like in, in more direct terms, what are the steps that we, in your mind, should take, have no choice but to take to get us to that values-based uh, block um, that you discussed? Um, is it, uh, you know, in Washington these days, we are talking about some sort of legislation that would review outbound American investment into China, which is, you know, something that is very difficult to do and, and, and certainly would be novel. Um, on the other hand, unlike in the in the days after World War II and the early days of the Cold War, which we sort of had a tabula rasa opportunity, let's call it, um, to make these terms, we have to start from the place of where we are, not from some blank slate. Right. And so is it, you know, the discussion obviously over the course of the Olympics and Uyghur genocide about, you know, should Western companies be doing business uh, in, in, in the Xinjiang region in China at all, mostly for, for moral reasons? Uh, should certain supply chain or or, um, or uh, critical investments be uh, taken out of China? Because if they were to be weaponized against us, or or they have already some degree been weaponized against us, what could we do? Uh, but it's it's a bit of a cacophony out there um, right. these days. I would argue uh, about what that is. So in your mind, you know, what are the three or four kind of most important steps to to that you think we need to take to get us there? Well, I, it is a cacophony, and I think it's also a jumble. You know, we're we're kind of doing various things, uh, but as far as I can tell, we don't have a coherent strategy. Uh, we're also constrained, I think, because our political leaders have gotten very used to talking a certain kind of language uh, about the virtues of multilateralism and uh, the importance of of um, economic openness and so on. And that's, that's all well and good. Um, but I think we have to, we're at a point where we have to kind of think beyond this, recognizing that our effort to build this global open system has failed uh, is the first step. But we're starting to do things in different domains and I'll take off a couple of them. Um, much tighter screening of foreign direct investment by Chinese companies in the United States, and it's also something that's starting to happen in, in Europe and in Asia as well. So instead of just saying, you know, any, any company, as long as it's, uh, you know, not, not a declared enemy of the United States uh, from any country can, can invest and can buy up um, companies in, in our country, uh, instead we've started to impose much tighter restrictions and screening and a lot of efforts by Chinese entities to invest in companies from which they pretty clearly hope to extract technology that they can use to build up their own industries. Uh, that's starting to happen and unclear exactly how far that's gonna go. Another thing that's started to happen 
is uh, the imposition of some export controls. So uh, on some uh, high-end semiconductor manufacturing technology, uh, we may not want China, we don't want China to catch up with us in a variety of uh, technological domains, both for strategic reasons and I think for economic reasons. And that's something that's a bit different for us. And we've had this idea that export controls were, you know, we didn't want to export military technology or dual use technology. I think it's beyond that, partly because the technologies now, the emerging technologies don't have that clear dividing line. Um, so export controls on various technologies. There too, uh, if we're the only producer of something, then we can do it unilaterally. But in most cases, we're not. Um, on the other hand, in, in most cases that matter, the number of countries that are at that level of technological sophistication is relatively small. And so imposing some collective restrictions on technology exports doesn't require creating a whole new kind of Cold War style export control system. So that's a second piece. Limitations on, on foreign direct investment, some limitations on uh, the export of technology. Um, you mentioned supply chains, and that's another piece of this. The COVID pandemic, among its other effects, has caused people again here and in other countries, advanced industrial countries, to recognize that the degree to which they have become dependent on a single source for uh, materials that become critical in a, in a health emergency, like personal protective equipment, or some of the precursor chemicals to manufacture drugs, um, equipment for ventilators, uh, motors for ventilators, that kind of thing. Um, that's all well and good when, well, first, when there isn't a pandemic, but when political relations are good. But what people have realized is that becomes, a, that dependence becomes a vulnerability under some situations and can be a strategic vulnerability that a hostile power can use to try to exert leverage over us or over our friends, uh, and that that's not acceptable. And therefore, we have to do things to try to encourage or require or induce American companies that are producing in some portion of what they manufacture in China in those critical areas to, at a, at a minimum, have some additional capacity that's not in China. Maybe it's preferably in the United States, but at least it's in countries that are friendly to us and proximate to us. And some of it could be in Mexico, some of it could be in Eastern Europe. Um, we're just in the process of, we're just beginning that. Um, and the administration has undertaken an initial review. Um, it's not only production, it's also certain materials, uh, so-called rare earth metals. Uh, China has become the dominant producer of many of those, not because uh, all the geological deposits of those materials happen to be in China, but because the process of digging them out of the ground is messy and dirty and can create environmental problems. So we've sort of let that go. But there too, uh, if that material is critical for the manufacture of high-end electronics or of uh, new kinds of power storage batteries, you can't allow yourself to be in a position where you're totally dependent on a potentially hostile power for those materials. So there's a process that started that hasn't, I think, gotten very far of that's going to require intervention by government to induce companies to do things that maybe they would prefer not to do on a kind of short term profit only basis. Um, the last part is maybe the biggest and uh, the, the trickiest. So already we've talked about some uh, barriers or some ways in which we are gonna disentangle ourselves from China. What about you know, the rest of the, the things that we trade? Um, it may be that some of that's uh, you know, harmless, doesn't have strategic significance. If we're buying um, tennis shoes uh, that are manufactured in, in China, or maybe even color TVs, and we're exporting grain to them and soybeans, uh, that's, there, there's not an obvious 
vulnerability that results from that, or if there is a vulnerability, it's kind of mutual. But what we've seen uh, in recent years is that the fact that so many countries in the West have, uh, or the companies in those countries have become dependent or believe that they must be, uh, have access to the Chinese market because it's growing, this is where they're gonna make a lot of profit, they can sell many of their products. That desire creates a, a, the potential for political leverage. So even if it's you know, soybeans, if soybean is or your only export, or even if it's wine and uh, you know, uh, beef from, from Australia, if that's a, those exports are a major part of your economy, the fact that the Chinese government can threaten to, on a dime to stop importing those products puts you in a vulnerable position. So what does that mean? Strategically, it means it would make, from a national perspective, and in, in that case, from the perspective of companies that are already suffering, to develop other markets, to look elsewhere for places to sell your products and not to allow yourself to become so dependent on China because that creates a political vulnerability. And, and there too, I think there's gonna to have to be some government intervention uh, and the direction in which I think it makes sense to go is to further lower barriers that exist still to trade and investment among a group of countries that actually do believe in principle in free trade that are actually liberal law abiding democratic countries. And as you move in that direction, I think what emerges is something that begins to resemble the system that existed uh, during the Cold War. It would be different in certain respects. I don't expect that China would be uh, totally locked out of it. I think there would still be quite a bit of, of uh, trade and some investment between China and, and uh, these other countries. But I think it, it's gonna be less if we go in this direction, less than it would otherwise be. Um, and I think that makes sense from a strategic point of view. It may have costs, it will have some costs, certainly costs of transition, uh, but the alternative is, I think, increasingly unacceptable. One consequence of, of what's happening in Europe now is that uh, I think it's the, the shock of realizing what Russia, at least under Putin, is capable of doing has caused people, including in Germany, maybe in particular, um, to realize that the extent to which they've allowed themselves to become dependent on Russian energy uh, creates a political vulnerability that's unacceptable. And so now, what do you have to do? Well, you have to spend money to build, uh, maybe it's uh, LNG facilities, maybe you have to contemplate uh, restarting nuclear reactors, uh, stuff that you might not want to do otherwise, and it might be more expensive than continuing to buy that inexpensive, relatively inexpensive gas. But uh, what you have to do for political and strategic reasons, I, I think that's, we're going to see that happening in Europe as regards Russia, and I think we're going to see it happening over time as regards China as well. Right. Well, uh, let's go to some questions, because I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. So. Uh, Victoria Hui, I'm uh, uh, allowing you to talk as the Zoom lingo goes. I think you're still muted. Oh, Victoria, I don't know if you can hear me, but you're if you unmute yourself, you can ask your question. All right. Well, maybe we'll we'll come back. Uh, we'll come back to you in a second. Uh, uh, Richard Bernstein, um, you had a question. Um, yes, you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Right. Um, I was wondering. Uh, <clears throat> you uh, you cited that economist of 2000, 2010 who uh, predicted that if the Chinese productivity could equal that of the United States, it would have an economy four times the great. And you sort of dismissed it and said, well, you don't think that that's going to happen. I was just wondering what makes you, I think you've answered some of that question now because we're going to try to stop it from happening uh, by the measures that you outlined. But I'm wondering, just in terms of the Chinese economy itself, why you feel that uh, the Chinese economy couldn't become, say, two times as great as the, as the American economy uh, if not four times as great? Well, I, 
I didn't mean to say that I thought it was impossible. Um, I don't think it's going to happen uh, unless uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party uh, undertakes these liberalizing policies that they've been so resistant to. Uh, I don't think they're going to be able to force uh, the technological advances that they're trying to achieve from with a sort of top-down uh, approach that would allow them to increase productivity to the levels that would be equivalent to those uh, nationally of, of the United States and other advanced industrial countries. I don't think they're going to be able to do that. Um, it may be that they will be able to make some increases, some improvements, even without fundamentally altering their system, in which case their, their economy could uh, grow to be larger than ours. I should say also, though, that you know, they've, they've got a, a, an assortment of other problems that are going to weigh down on their ability to grow rapidly. And they now you know, increasingly acknowledge them. Um, Partly it has to do with the rapidly aging population. Partly it has to do with the, kind of the, the costs of ameliorating accumulated uh, decades of accumulated environmental damage. Part of it may have to do with something which has not gotten as much attention perhaps as it deserves, which is the still very poor conditions uh, in the rural areas, which still, uh, in which still reside uh, you know, I forget what the number is, it's 600 million or 800 million uh, Chinese people. Um, and apparently things in many of the, those parts of China outside the big developing cities are, uh, are pretty grim. I mean, the aggregate statistics show, yes, people's per capita income has gone up, but um, I'm trying to remember the name of, of the author, Hidden, the book is, I think it's Hidden China, but uh, finds that there is um, kind of systematic low performance in education on the part of children. Uh, and this may have to do in part with the fact that in many cases, parents have gone to the cities to work and there's less intellectual stimulation. And I have not looked into all of this, but uh, all of this is to say there are considerable burdens on their ability to grow at a rate that would allow them uh, to you know, overtake, not only overtake the U.S. in terms of the total economy, but far eclipse it. It doesn't mean that they couldn't solve those problems, but I think the economists are probably right that they're not going to achieve that potential unless and until they make fundamental changes in their system, which means fundamental changes in their political system. I don't see that happening. Thomas Tayama, if you introduce yourself and ask your question, please. Thomas, I don't know if you can hear me. You can go ahead, ask your question. Still, it looks like still muted. Yeah. All right, well, I think maybe maybe I'll, I'll use the opportunity then to maybe ask the last question uh, if, uh, if something about our mute function is working. So you, you end your article walking through these five alternatives and, and obviously suggesting if not I'm talking about the one that you think we need to work towards. And obviously part of our conversation here is outlining some steps to be able to do that. Um, let's say we do go in that direction, um, as difficult as, as, it, as it is going to be, um, given, I think, some of the um, obstacles and, and various coalitions in the United States that kind of lead that out. What is the Chinese reaction to that? Uh, what is the Chinese reaction if we really are creating some sort of values-based block? Um, will they contest it? Um, would they be content outside of it? You know, it says, well, the United States used to want to liberalize the whole world. They've now admitted defeat um, and accepted that it's only going to be 50%, 60% of global GDP. And that number will shrink because they have all sorts of other issues and demographics and so on and so forth. Um, that they're, they're putting up ramparts around a shrinking territory uh, as opposed to now we're going to see this victory. Or are they going to be continuing to do things, even if we were to move in that direction, uh, to try and breach those ramparts, you know, mess up those, uh, those moats and drawbridges and so forth? Well, as I said, I think what they're already trying to do is to further sort of fortify their own system and to expand the zone, which will be largely under their influence. They're trying to persuade us to remain open. I think they're very concerned about the possibility that uh, 
the United States and the other advanced industrial countries would come together uh, to take these protective measures I mentioned, but also potentially to apply pressure to China to try to get it to change. I said the US alone wasn't able to do that, but the US plus Japan plus the EU uh, is, is something else again. And, and by threatening tariffs, it might be possible to force some changes, uh, not, I don't think fundamental changes. So they're gonna try to prevent that. Uh, and how do they do that? It's partly by working within our systems. So a month or so ago, uh, I think it was a letter that was sent by the Chinese ambassador in Washington to uh, the CEOs of various companies saying that they really should go lobby the Congress to try to obstruct uh, some legislation that's coming down the pike that would have some of the provisions that I, that I mentioned. And that pretty ham-handed, but there are other more subtle ways you could do that. Um, and do it in other democratic countries, but also to make diff kind of differential offers. So deal, make a deal with the EU, but not with the United States. And they've floated the, some of these ideas or try to make one with Japan or Korea. Um, and so try to uh, encourage divisions. Um, that hasn't worked particularly well. Uh, one thing that if I were sitting in Beijing, I would be worried about as a result of the current crisis is that it may galvanize uh, much deeper uh, cooperation among democratic countries, both in Europe and in Asia uh, on a variety of issues. For one thing, it's gonna lead to more defense spending in Europe, uh, which means that it's not gonna be quite the, uh, the choice or the tension that many people have worried about for us, you know, putting more into Asia, what about Europe? Well. The Europeans are going to do some more. But I think there, uh, just generally, there's a recognition uh, of commonality of values among democracies in different parts of the world, and also recognition of the reality of the threat that's posed by these large authoritarian powers. Um, so un unanticipated consequence, perhaps, of all of this. Uh, but I think, I think it's worrisome. They'll step up their efforts to to prevent it from happening. They don't want it to happen in part, you mentioned the statistic, you know, 50 to 60% of GDP, I have the figure in the, in the article and you add up, so EU and CPTPP and USMCA, uh, it's between 50 and 60% of GDP and China is only 17 and Russia is only three. That's a pretty big margin of advantage uh, and that's not gonna erode anytime soon. And Chinese know that. Uh, and they know that the more closely we cooperate uh, and join our resources, the less progress they're going to be able to make in extending their influence and reshaping the world in which, you know, the world in which they would uh, ways that they would like to do. Well, uh, Aaron, I, I, this is the question uh, that obviously all is on the on our tip of our tongues and on our mind, uh, and has been and will be for quite some time. And and I'll be curious to see if six months from now or 18 months from now, some of the steps that you outlined that you think we ought to take, we've actually made progress on. Because I think these are discussions that have occurred for a while. It, it seems like there are more people discussing it, um, you know, which is which is a good thing. But um, there is a little bit, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it, uh, actions to it. Although like you, I've also been surprised at the um, European in particular reaction to Putin's invasion of Ukraine in a way that a week ago, I think most of us would have said was not likely. And so perhaps that will also have a galvanizing effect or a secondary effect on this question as well. Well, uh, I'll believe it when I see it too, although I think I see elements of it already. And in my view, the, what I'm more, most concerned about now is the obstacles to that inside the United States. So if we continue to have the kind of partisan divisions that we currently have, if we continue to have uh, the attitudes and policies that some of the people of the Republican Party have advocated and some on the left the Democratic Party have advocated, it may be difficult to create this consensus uh, that's necessary to take some of these steps. I've always felt that uh, while it would be desirable to be able to do this without a terrible shock, that it might require a shock. And the question in my mind now is whether what's happening is a sufficient shock to induce those changes. And the jury is out, I'm, but I'm guardedly optimistic. <laughs>
Well, uh, regardless, I would first commend you on the article. Um, and I've, I've put the PDF in the chat for everybody to see. But if you haven't read it yet, the growing rivalry between America and China and the future of globalization and the winter issue of Texas National Security Review. Uh, we're excited at the release of your book uh, in a couple months, Getting China Wrong, uh, which I think will be more expansive uh, than than obviously what just this article uh, focused on. And um, and uh, you know, uh, from your mouth to God's ears on, on, on a lot of different of these things. So Aaron, thanks for joining with us and talking about your work. Thanks a lot, Gabe. I really enjoyed it. It's good to see you. Have a great day, everybody.